Just right there right behind you. On the wall under you. Oh, should I flip them? You can, it'll give you a little mood lighting. Which one? I'm afraid I'm gonna like turn off the projector. <laughs> I'm good? Cool. Hey everybody, my name is Jesse Jordan. I am an alumni of RIT and of the SE program and used to be an SSC member. So this is really cool and I'm glad I'm able to give a talk to you guys. Um, this is actually a presentation I gave at Constant Contact. And so I thought it was really valuable and it'd be cool to give it to you guys and also get it recorded. So uh, that is in part why I'm here and because I love you guys. So um, the event was called Hooking It All Together because it had a bit to do with React and hooks. Um, this has to do with hooks, but less so React. So, all right, about me. Uh, I'm Jesse Jordan. Uh, like I said, I used to be here. I'm now an engineer at Constant Contact, and I've been working there for three years now. Constant Contact is a really cool place to work at. Um, it is a email marketing company. That is, we help small businesses send out newsletters. We also help them have kind of a social presence as well. So that includes sending, uh, creating ads or making social posts. Um, so it's a really cool way for small businesses to interact and collect new customers. Uh, well, I am currently on the reporting team, and so that involves kind of making fancy charts and visualizations so that people understand how their campaigns are doing, if they're getting new customers, and how uh, how many you know clicks they're getting, how many unsubscribes they're getting, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is actually a chart that we built uh, on the ads project, showing like how many clicks per day they were getting, and so. It's really cool stuff to see. And so that involves a lot of front end stuff. I also do a little bit of back end, but that's not as interesting as well. So outside of work, I also do a lot of web apps. And I actually built my own view framework, a project called Tram1. And so a lot of you are probably wondering, why build your own view framework? Why not just do React? React's pretty chill, right? And it is. But for me, at least, Tram1 was a really cool opportunity to play around with things, right? And I think a lot like music, programming has to do with seeing what's there, putting a twist on something, kind of playing homage to what already exists, but also seeing if you can do something or if you can do something even better. And I think if you think about other ways of doing web dev before React, um, you could kind of consider that maybe like classical music and maybe at one point industry standards. And now we have React and Tram 1, and that's like a hip hop or jazz. <laughs> um, it's all about putting a twist on things. And for me, at least, like Tram 1 has been my opportunity to do that. For a lot of people, even just using React or using hooks in React was a pretty significant twist. For me, though, if I wanted to start using hooks, which is a fairly new addition to React, um, I wouldn't just be able to just you know import use state and then start running with it. All my projects run Tram 1. So that wasn't going to work as well. Instead, I'd probably have to start converting some of my projects to React. But I really like Tram 1, and so doing that would, didn't seem like a lot of... Um, it was worthwhile if I wanted to play around with hooks. But instead, maybe I could do one better. I could build my own hooks for Tram 1. Nice. And so since that first option wouldn't nearly be as interesting to talk about, without further ado, I'm going to talk about Bebop hooks, <laughs> how to build your own hook system, and why anybody would be crazy enough to do it. So <coughs> before we get into the hook stuff, I just want to briefly talk about Tram 1. So why build your own view framework? Why make a view framework project and why not just use React? These are questions I get a lot every time I bring up Tram 1. And so Tram 1 has been like a three year long project pretty much ever since I graduated from RIT. It came out of playing around with other view frameworks and never, like, having, really enjoying that, but never finding something as clear or concise as JSX. One project that I did have a lot of fun playing around with, though, was a project called Chu, which had added, actually had architected all of their, um, all of the logic, so building the DOM, creating custom tags, doing the dipping, into separate projects, which made it super easy to kind of consume and glue in different ways myself. So that's what became Trem1. And so even though now each one of those has been forked and tweaked ever so slightly, 
um, it's still, it, it would be misleading to say that this was a solo project. So today, Tram1 is my de facto view framework, in part because I'm super familiar with it, in part because I want to make sure that things are still working, but also in part because I really, really enjoy writing in it. I think it's much better than other alternatives, and I think it's better than React, but that's super biased, and I'll <laughs> end the self-promotion now. Let's talk about those. So, React books are really, really, really cool. And when I first saw them, I thought they were brilliant. I thought this was the super coolest thing, and I desperately wanted them in Tram 1. Because up until this point, Tram 1 didn't have class components. You could only do function components, and the only way to drive those function components was through props, which was pretty much true for React all the way up until hooks. You couldn't use state, though. Like, that was not an option. So if I wanted to keep that the case and not re-architect everything, still keep my components function components, that meant I was going to have to put state somewhere else, in some global store somewhere off to the side. And that would also mean that each component would need to know how to, when they called use state, how do I get the data that is for me, for my component? So in essence, I need a global sort, and I need a way to determine which component is asking for that data in the store. My initial idea was just using the window object as my global store and using whatever stack trace I could get out of JavaScript for determining the component. Both of, the, both of these ideas were bad, but only one of them was so bad that I had to change things up and kind of re-architect things. The stack trace idea did work, but the only way to get a stack trace on JavaScript, at least when I was playing around with it, was throwing an error, catching it, turning it into a string, and then parsing that string, and it works. But it didn't make me feel good inside, and I just didn't want that to be my legacy. So I decided, I'll just build my own stack. Um, so in essence, if we were building like a home page with a header component and a title, I was just going to build an array, and I would just keep track of each string, the name of that component. And that would be my stack trace. Um, and what that string would turn into when I'm looking for the data to store would be at this key. So if we're in the title component and you call view state, the key would look like home slash header slash title. And then the index, um, the default value here is zero. But this is just because it's the first hook that's being called. So um, yeah, this is the key. And this is how we would know where in the store our data would live. And so we have a place, and we know how to get that data from that store, but we still need a way to trigger re-renders and to tell Tram1 that, hey, if I call set state, like update campaign name or whatever it is that's coming out of the state, that you need to re-render everything. So we need a way to update the window and trigger re-renders all on Kong set state with a global store, this should all start sounding familiar if you're familiar with uh, global app state management tools, because this is exactly the problem that Redux solves. It's the problem that Context, state, context API solves, right? This is how we do app state management for projects. For Tram1, we already had something for this. It's a project called Hover Engine, which uh, was built for Tram1, but works in vanilla JavaScript. It's basically the same interface as Redux, but um, it has some niceties with it. But it was already in Tram1, so I didn't need to build anything new. I was just going to re-expose this in a different way to do my new state hooks. And again, it was already built in Tram1, so I didn't have to add any new dependencies. The bundle wasn't going to get any bigger for this. So whereas before, Hover Engine had was distributing props into components, and had these actions that we could call the update state, that was just going to become use state. That was just going to be our new interface for how we were updating our components. And for me, at least, this was really, really interesting because where before I thought use state was this kind of hacky way to give component state, at least in Tram 1, use state is how we, is a different interface for just app state management. It does nothing to do with the component's internal logic. So I don't know how React does it in, in all honesty, but at least for Tram1, it's just app state management with a nicer interface. All right, 
So if you look at some of the hooks that React provides, they provide a lot of hooks. And I wasn't super interested in doing all the additional ones, at least not for MVP, but I did need some of the basic ones. And we already talked about use state. So what about use effect? Well, if you're familiar with use effect, it has some weird quirks, or at least what I thought were not super intuitive. First of all, use effect happens every time you trigger a re-render. So every time this component updates, it's going to call that effect and it'll clean up that effect unless you have these dependencies at the bottom and you always need those dependencies even if you would only want it to call on now. And you have to return this cleanup function, which is really weird, but I guess you have to do it and it was strange and didn't make sense, at least to me, right off the bat. So I thought maybe I could do one better. Maybe since most of my web apps, I just need to fetch data. I don't need a cleanup, and I don't want to fetch every time I'm rendering. Maybe I'll just have an on mount effect, and then later down the line, I would build an on update effect. As I was building these, though, I realized that pretty much the logic was going to be exactly the same, and I didn't need to split these up. But I still wanted mount to be the default over the update effect. So to clarify, again, if you don't have these dependencies, every time you re-render a component, it's going to call that effect over and over again. And React even admits that this is a little unintuitive, but they do it for technical and testing reasons and so on. For me, though, I decided maybe this wording, dependencies, is a bit of a misnomer. Instead, we'll call them triggers. And the idea is if you have triggers, when those triggers change, we'll clean up and call you know, a new hook, a new use effect. But if they don't have any and you don't change them, we're not going to call your effect again. So basically the same functionality just kind of flipped around. And so the, the trigger would actually become part of the key. So before, um, you know, home header title zero, that's the same. But we include this tr uh, the triggers at the end as strings. So in this case, bar or the use effect got called again, and it was foo, and we called with foo. And so this is how we know that your effect is new or updated. And so at least for trend one, how this looks is after a whole render loop, we look at, OK, what effects did we have before? What effects do we have now? If title foo disappeared um, between renders, then we know, hey, we need to clean that up. And if there was a no title bar and now there is, then we know, hey, this is a new effect. We need to call it, and we'll save the cleanup for later. And actually, as I was building this out, I kind of realized why React actually forces you not to wrap things in conditionals. Because if you do, if you wrap hooks in conditionals, then React could inadvertently assume that your component unmounted and it needed to be cleaned up. Um, I actually show this in the next slide here. So in this case, right, if we have this conditional, if true, and the hooks are title 0, title 1, and then we have a use state which is incremented to title 2, then all of a sudden this conditional comes false, all of our indexing gets screwed up, tram 1 thinks that it needs to start cleaning up these effects, and a lot of bad side effects start happening because now we're looking for data in a place that a effect used to be and everything gets wonky. So I don't know 100% why React forces you to do this, but for Tram1 at least, the indexing is super important and that's why you can't start wrapping things in loops or conditions. So we talked about use state, we talked about use effect. The last one with like the most required hooks is use context. But for those of you who are familiar with Context API and uh, React in general know that Context API is a pretty big endeavor, and it's not something that I really wanted to tackle for my you know, small you know, pet project. So I did want, and again, if you're not familiar with Context API, the idea is giving global state to your entire app. That is useful. And so I wanted something similar. I wanted to be able to use this use state hook regardless of where I am in the app, and point to the, global, the same space in the global store. So I actually did my own custom hook called use global state. And so that hook actually lets me point to any component and say, hey, always look this same place in the store. So what that looks like is instead of using the key here, 
I'm just, I pass in at the beginning, hey, this is the key campaign name, and that's where you'll find the data that I'm looking for. And then if you call that set state, um, or the set campaign name, if I return <coughs> that, right, then that would re-trigger all the components to update as need be. And for me personally, this hook has been super valuable. For any simple project, instead of building a whole provider and context API and everything, the boilerplate that React requires you to, I could just have this use global state, and that's where my data would be, regardless of where I am now. All right, we're getting towards the end, so let's start talking about some of the takeaways. The first takeaway is that hooks are not locked, hooks do not lock you into using React. So aside from the fact that other frameworks have started implementing their own hooks, one of the conversations we had at Constant Contact was, you know, if we start architecting our apps this way, if we build libraries, are we going to be stuck in a place where we can't, you know, move away from React, right? And that's not the case. If you build hooks, they can work in any framework, and if that framework doesn't have hooks, it's not that hard to build. Um, Dan Abernoff, who actually first talked about hooks at ReactConf, actually has his own blog over Reacted, and he talks about the internal workings of React. It's a very good read. It's not super, super technical. It's very approachable, and I highly recommend reading it. For me, at least, it was super important because as I was fighting how to implement use effect and use state, this was the source of truth of how React was doing it. And their source code isn't as pretty. So <laughs> this is a good resource. And yeah, worst case scenario, you have a framework and you want hubs, just go make a Git repo and start playing around with it. Maybe you spend a few months. I don't know. Um, maybe you don't. I, this isn't a real repo, by the way. If you have Spring Boot and you want hooks, you can go do that. Not, don't look for this one. Um, there's bigger takeaways here, though. Um, for me, Hooks was a really cool way to look at an interface that another company had built and kind of recreate it, try my own hand at it. It was a way for me to see pain points uh, for React and why those pain points existed, and maybe instances like use global state where I could do something one better. Um, and I don't think you guys should go home and build your own Hooks system. That isn't the goal here. I mean, it would be really cool, but I think the idea here is that there's things you can play around with, right? React has a bajillion ports. Um, and maybe it's not the easiest source code to read. Maybe you look at two or trim one. But um, it's obvious that like people are like going into these repos and playing around with them, right? And the idea is you twist things. You try a new thing. Maybe it's something in the Git issue. Maybe it's something you just want to see, right? It's a way of playing around with new tools and new frameworks and new stuff and putting your own spin on it, right? It's my own freeform jazz, uh, my avant-garde coding. I hope I've convinced you through this talk that it's worthwhile to do this stuff. And yeah, it's not React and it's not like this industry standard of the symphony, but it's new, it's exciting, and it always kicks. <laughs> Last note, um, so it is the middle of October, and I'm sure that some of you are probably aware Hacktoberfest is going on. If you aren't already like four PRs into that, <laughs> it's a way of getting free swag, and so totally check out Tram1. We have a whole project board filled with issues that you guys can pick up, um, and if you need any help, you can just like bug me on the Slack or include comments, and like I'd be happy to help you guys kind of understand my madness. So, um, yeah, that's like free swag. But there's also free swag there. So, you know, if you want that, that's like cool too. Um, do you guys have any questions for me about Tram1, about React hooks, about constant contact, about, I don't know, whatever, RIT? Yeah. yeah. So I was actually curious, because you mentioned Tram1 a lot. Are you incorporating that with your work in Constant Contact? Because it, it seems like that's your own personal project. It, it very much is my own personal project. And I wouldn't, I would never recommend it as like, oh yeah, Constant Contact, this is what we should be doing. But like I mentioned before, this has like been a really valuable exercise for discussions that we have. So at Constant Contact, we have this front end guild where we talk about what's possible, what do we want to be doing, what do we want to see. And so my work in Tram1 involved like, 
hooks and SSR, or server-side rendering, and all of that have kind of helped me be more engaged in those conversations that maybe only architects would be. So again, this is just a playground for me to see like what's possible, why are things hard, and then so when I bring them up that like, hey, you know what, anybody could build hooks, we don't have to worry about like being vendor logged here, that's been like super valuable. And sometimes people believe me, and other people think that I use stack traces, so you know, <laughs> um, either or. <laughs> um, other questions? I could just stack here. I can talk more about the hooks and stuff. Well, I, Why did you choose to index your hooks instead of having them by So I needed to index the hooks in part because if there were multiple copies of a component, it wouldn't be enough just to do branches. And then also because um, <coughs> just in general, that was just one more way to keep them unique and consistently unique, right? Like I can't apply random IDs to them, because that might change over multiple renders, but this would be consistent, as long as like um, the ordering didn't change, right? Or like you were shuffling components around, which even React kind of argues you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was kind of something that I learned, like, oh, this is why you don't loop hooks, right? You can't have like a loop, like a for loop of use state, because yeah, then bad things will happen. So. <coughs> Other questions? Also, I don't, I'm not 100% sure. I, that's not to say indexing would be the best solution, and it certainly could be changed. So, yo, free PRs, man. Just, <laughs> um, and the source code's pretty easy to read. I've like spent a lot of time documenting everything, so if people were like, yo, I want to add this thing to Trend 1, then like, I'd be like, sure, man, let's make it happen. And then, you know, you can enter my madness. That is Trend 1. Any other questions? Did you guys like the talk? Any feedback from me? Like, you should stop the recording now before they comment on it. No, I'm joking. Um, cool. Oh, question over there. Yeah, how did you get the like two frame switch? Image yeah, I was like, that? that's okay. fire. The presentation is actually fire. Thank you. Um, is it MS Paint? No, no. All right, so what, this. This was a very difficult endeavor, and PowerPoint does not like you doing this. Yeah, but I was basically, to say. Um, it's a half. Um, it, I drew everything in OneNote, which is my note taking tool, and then basically I drew it, copied and pasted it into an image, and then drew it again. So each slide was like 10 minutes to make, uh, not including like writing the script and everything else. And then they are animated, so you can't loop appear and disappear animations. You can loop like movement stuff, but to do this, I have an audio clip on every slide that's 0.6 seconds long, and there are bookmarks in that audio clip, and the audio clip just triggers making the first one appear, and then the second one appear, and it just, yeah. Dude, I appreciate it. Yeah. This is a weird Dude, hack, I, I, and the video that explains it only has like 24 likes, and I'm like, this person deserves a medal. This is bad, yeah. and really bad. Like, if you needed to feel like good about yourself, and like uh, this 10 minutes per slide was worth it, like I would like to say I enjoyed it. Yeah. Okay. Can you turn the recording back on, just so he can repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, it, they, they look fun, I like it. No, I, you know, in part, like, usually I just do static drawings, but I always like to one-up myself, and so just as a way to make like an engaging presentation, right? Because here's the deal, you guys, like presentations don't get better when you get, you know, in the workforce. Like they just stay bad. So whatever you're seeing now, it's kind of more of the same. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can make cool, engaging presentations and then people will be excited and actually like pay attention. So like put the effort in, stay in school, don't do drugs. Turtle power. Okay. <laughs> you got a question? Yeah, I was going to ask, is there any like security concern in having just one function to arbitrarily access global state and global store? Dude, I don't know, man. It's all client side, dude. If somebody screws it up on for themselves, right, like that's on them, right? That's how I treat web development, right? It's, it's like kind of the safe space because they're running it on their machine, right, it's, you know, if they're like, if somebody maliciously does something, I don't know, you just gotta trust whoever website you're going to. 
But Shram one is great. Don't worry about that. The seal of approval. So, with, because you're pointing at a store with your uh, global, yeah. If they put in the component path, like you have, like, would oh, that access? Oh, in the global, uh, yeah. yes. You could potentially add, oh, no, you can't. Because oh, there's okay. actually two different hover engines. One for the global oh. engine, and one for the... Uh, use like the local component state, yes. so they won't actually interact with yes. each other. So, uh, yeah, I'm running two instances of that global store. So, for better or worse, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, everything is namespaced in the window object. So, if you actually look at the window object, you won't see anything right away. You have to do, like window dot tram global store or window dot like tram. Uh, component store and stuff like that, which has actually been super useful for debugging. Yeah. Uh, one day I'll make a Chrome extension to make it obvious. Cool. Again, feel free to debug me afterwards. Uh, thanks again, guys, for coming to the talk. Kill it. <laughs>